Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to another episode in the series, The Cross Questioned. And we have been looking at, in this series, how there are so many issues relating to the faithful Easter weekend as narrated or explained or written about in the pages of the New Testament. And in fact, we're not interested in the entire New Testament. We're only interested in four books and of those four books, we're not interested in the entire four books. We're only interested in the last chapter or last two chapters of each of these books. And so we've seen in this series that there are countless numbers of discrepancies. Many theories that one could look at that are as credible, if not more credible, than the way a Christian theologian or the church has chosen to interpret it. In fact, these theories hold more water than those that are projected by modern-day churches or even those churches that were developed in the breakaway from Catholicism all those years ago. The idea of a God coming to earth, dying and being resurrected is one that is extremely difficult to prove in the pages of the Bible. It is almost impossible to build a doctrine around these theories based on the Easter events. And oftentimes when we speak about the crucifixion or about salvation, way too much is built around the crucifixion scene. Christians would like you to believe that if the crucifixion scene is untruth or not true, then Christianity would still survive because it doesn't matter whether he was crucified or not, it still remains that Jesus was a God. Well, this is not true because the entire Christian doctrine, the core of it, stands and falls on whether there was a crucifixion scene at all. It doesn't matter to the Christian doctrine whether he was resurrected from it. Believe me, it doesn't matter whether Jesus was resurrected from the crucifixion or not for Christianity to hold. It matters that he had to die. That's the only thing that matters in Christianity. Because if you remove the resurrection, they will still claim, Christians will still claim and say, well, he died as a sacrifice. It was the blood that was needed. So if we can prove, and we have been, that just one part, there are three parts of the crucifixion. The person being placed on the cross, somebody dying on the cross, and somebody being resurrected from the cross. We're not interested in who has been put on the cross. We're not interested in who rises from the cross. We just have to prove that Jesus was not dead or that he was not put on the cross. If we can create that scenario, then the rest of Christianity ceases to exist. And so this is what the series is actually all about, questioning the cross. And we have given countless numbers of explanations that are as acceptable, if not more so, than the ones that have been presented by Christianity and not from external sources, not using any theories that come from outside sources, purely from the text itself. Now we're going to move on to show you yet another classic example of how we can look at the text from many, many different points of view to prove that the crucifixion scene or the person on that cross either is not Jesus, never died, or was somebody else purely from the text. We as Muslims do not agree with any of this anyway. But we are giving it to you from what we see in the text. And in the text we see that when this person, whoever it might be, but for the sake of Christian understanding, we are following their text. And in John chapter 19, verse 39 and 40, it talks about an event that took place. Now all three of the synoptic gospels tell us that this man came and took the body. This man's name was Joseph. And he took the body, wrapped it up, and put it into a tomb, the dead body, or the body that was bound to the cross, or was bound to the scaffolding, or was bound to a tree. We have different versions saying different things, whether it was a tree, whether it was a cross, whether it was a scaffolding. None of them say that he was crucified. All of them said he was placed on this apparatus, whatever it might have been, which is interesting all on its own. Now, it continues to say in John, which is different to the other synoptic gospels. It says in John chapter 19, it says, A mixture of spices were made, myrrh and aloe, 
it was about 100 pounds in weight. So a mixture is bought made of myrrh and aloes. We know today that aloe has a healing quality in it. Especially today, it's become very, very popular amongst women to use aloe creams and aloe hair conditioners and soaps and all sorts of other things. And myrrh also has a disinfectant and healing quality to it. So in John chapter 19, it says a mixture of myrrh and aloe was bought about 100 pound in weight. Then they took it to the body of Jesus and wound him in linen cloth with the spices. And this was the manner in which the Jews would bury a person. Well, this is the first time that we hear that this aloe and myrrh was used instead of washing the body. If I spoke to a number of rabbis, I've spoken to head rabbis, and they have all told me that the body is washed. This aloe and myrrh is something that is not common or not found in Judaism. Normally the body would be washed. There may be ointments or things put on, but not specifically aloe and myrrh. Now most likely, Nicodemus must have bought a mixture to give to this body in some way or the other. And perhaps this mixture that was used was not to give to a dead body, but was used as a antiseptic, was used for this unconscious body, or as a form of resuscitating a body. This is just as feasible because the type of spices that we see used are not the traditional spices that we see given. If you remember that when the prophet Isa or Jesus Christ is being born according to the New Testament, when the three wise men, and that is a whole series on its own that can be done with that myth, when they arrived, they bought myrrh and they bought frankincense and they bought gold and it is described and it's a prophecy that they will use that frankincense and myrrh when he is going to die. So here we have aloe being used. So there is a great amount of skepticism amongst a number of scholars in the world today at why this mixture was given. So we can look and assume just as much as we can say it was used for burial as we can say it was used for resuscitation or it was used to preserve the wounds on the body, whatever they may have been. Remember, the actual piercing of the crucifixion with nails is only found in a text outside of the Bible, not in a text even acceptable by Christians. We only hear that he was bound. So the only wounds that they would have to prepare would be those ones that he received when he was punched in the face, or when his beard was pulled, or when he got lashed. That's about the only wounds we are talking about here. We're not talking about fatal wounds. We are talking about superficial wounds. And even if we go according to the theory that he was whipped with a cat of nine tails, again, we are using a theory that comes from external sources, not from internal sources. How do you know he was whipped with lashes from a whip that was embedded with pieces of clay and pottery and all the rest of it? because we don't find the gospel writers all agreeing on this. These are found from external sources. We are relying on the internal sources alone. You can't pull things from outside and throw them in here because we can do exactly the same thing, bring it from outside and say that there is only a single whip with a single lash on it and it wasn't embedded with anything and there's no such thing as the cat of nine tails that were used. So you have to use the text. You can't bring external things in and use external sources because you will not accept us if we bring in external sources. So we have to rely on the source only. What about the actual grave or the actual sepulcher that this body is placed into? If we read John's version of the description of what he said the grave or the tomb looked like, as we find in John chapter 19, verse 41 and 42, it says, now they took him to the place where he was crucified, near to where he was crucified, there was a garden. And there in that garden was a brand new tomb or a new tomb that no one had yet used for burial. And they took him there and they placed him there in the evening, because it was the evening of the Jewish Sabbath, and they laid his body in this new grave that no one had used before. This is paraphrased what you will find in John chapter 19. And I haven't exaggerated anything. It says, it was not yet used for burial. And 
it was near the evening of the Jewish Sabbath, and that's where they lay him. Now, it's very, very convenient. If we look at it from the skeptic's point of view, how convenient that the place where the person is going to be crucified just happens to be the same place where the tomb is. So there's no long trail where witnesses will see the body, no groups of people that can come around and see that perhaps he is not dead or is dead, or perhaps it's not the person that they thought was crucified. Perhaps they would say, but this is not Jesus of Nazareth. This is not Jesus, son of Mary, but somebody else. So it's convenient to have the location of the burial right near crucifixion. This smacks of a conspiracy. It smacks of pre-planning. Or if it isn't, it's miraculous coincidence that yet another one of these coincidences is thrown in place. The coincidence of somebody just happening to come and carry the cross for Jesus. The coincidence of just happening to be given a drugged drink to drink. The coincidence of him happening to die after three hours immediately after he drinks the substance that is offered to him. The miraculousness of him being able to be bound to the cross and not crucified to the cross. The miraculousness of not having his legs broken when all the other people that are with him have their legs broken and so he doesn't suffocate and die. And the miraculousness of him being taken down and put in a tomb that just happens to be there. Too many coincidences for us to say this is possible. It cannot be accepted when there are so many miraculousnesses, <laughs> if there is such a word. So was this deliberately planned like this? If we read Mark chapter 15, verse 46, it says that the tomb was cut out of the rock. So the place where he was crucified was called Golgotha. The rock face looked like a skull, and there were caves in it. You can imagine a rock looking like hollow eyes and a mouth and maybe nose. So one of those places, it was cut out of that place where he was buried. Literally, maybe even lowered him, maybe even just put him off the cross and put him directly into it too. Maybe it was that close. We don't know the actual distance, but it says that it was in the garden where his crucifixion took place. So Matthew tells us that it was Joseph of Arimathea's own unused tomb where this took place. Well, it's time for us to take a break. And when we get back from the break, we'll continue looking at these many theories, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome back. We are continuing with our series of cross question, and it may seem a mere coincidence that Joseph of Arimathea was a person who was not from Jerusalem, yet somehow, miraculously, he just happens to have a tomb in this garden in Jerusalem. And it just so happens that this Joseph of Arimathea happens to be a disciple of Jesus. We don't even know if Joseph of Arimathea was a disciple. But we are saying according to the Christian text, it says he was a disciple. But we as Muslims, we have no idea who these people were. But it could all be later mythology. It could all be storytelling that developed over many years. And this is how he was claimed to be a disciple. But it actually works against the Christian story. It creates more doubt. It makes you think that, how did this man, Joseph of Arimathea, just happen to have a tomb at the same place that he wasn't even a citizen of, didn't even live in the city? Why would you have a burial place in a city you didn't live at? You're going to bring your body, which was not heard of anyway, a two or three day journey from where you live. When you die, you would never be permitted to be buried three days later. You were to be buried the same day. So the whole thing smacks of lies, conspiracies, later developments, or misunderstandings, or even that the text never existed in the first place, that somebody is writing this all at a much later stage, didn't have knowledge of Jewish traditions, didn't have knowledge of the customs, and he's writing it from a Greek perspective. When Jews go and investigate the New Testament, they literally take the book and refuse to read it anymore because they say it is full of so many inconsistencies. And we as Muslims, 
When we read it, we don't want to just put the book down and walk away. We want to read the book and warn you of these inconsistencies. And it may not be very useful for many people to say, well, what's the big problem? Why are you going through this? Why must you cause division and dissension? Because your eternity, your soul depends on it. Whether or not you spend your life in hell or paradise depends on what you decide after you've listened to this series. Maybe some people will think that's a bit too dramatic, but it's the honest truth. If you are doing things that are against what God told you to do, when Allah, when the creator of everything says, you shall have no other gods before me, and you turn Jesus into a God, you are breaking the commands of God. This is why it cannot be that people say, well, perhaps, you know, we can't be judges, we can't say anything. I mean, uh, maybe the Christians are right and they will be in paradise. You are breaking the fundamental command of God. You are breaking Tawheed. You are breaking the fundamentals of belief. And that is to submit to one God. To submit to the one true God. So let's move on because we are moving into uh, other areas here. So perhaps if we wanted to look at it, he might have been using this Joseph of Arimathea. Perhaps another explanation that sometimes has been given by some of the apologists. They say, listen, maybe it's a family tomb. Maybe it belongs to a family. And it was a family tomb that was in the garden. But that would go against the text again. I'm sorry you don't get an out by saying, well, maybe you're just looking at it in the wrong way. It was a family tomb. Remember, this is just assumptions that they are making. There's no credible evidence for saying maybe it was a family tomb that was in the garden. It could have been a family tomb. I'll give you one main reason why this is not acceptable. Because the text said, having made a newly hewed tomb, it means a newly dug out tomb near the place of the crucifixion, seems to go against any theory that you might want to grab from somewhere else that says it was a family tomb. It says in the text it was newly made. So why would a family tomb exist that had never been dug out? Which means it wasn't a family tomb. It was a conveniently, coincidentally, perfectly placed and timed cut out of a tomb. If you believe the text, most likely that this tomb was specially prepared, specially made in a way to safely protect this body. Who knows how it was made? Many of the tombs, when I visited places like Palestine, when I visited places like Saudi Arabia and other places like that, and I looked at the caves, many of these caves are interlinked. Even in Africa, when you go to Ethiopia and places like this, there are whole cities that are created from these mazes that they have in the cave. Who knows how many entrances and exits this cave may have had? Perhaps it had a secret passageway created. We don't know. We are just throwing things out there. There's no credibility in what I'm saying. I'm just saying it as a possibility. Just like the apologist is grabbing things out of the air and saying it was a family tomb that was in the garden, I can grab something out of the air and say maybe there were connections into this newly created tomb and the body was simply slipped out of there People came to look at the tomb and it was empty because they took it out the back door. And we even said, what's the purpose for moving the stone out anyway? I don't get that. I don't understand the reason for moving the stone. If the reason was to prove that the body wasn't there, who cares? If Jesus was going to appear to the people anyway, to 500 people, to the disciples, to many witnesses, they didn't need to have a look inside the tomb because he was going to appear to them. He could have simply projected himself through the wall as he did in the upper room, as he did on the road to Emmaus, as he did on countless numbers of occasions according to Christians where he appeared again alive. There's no reason for the tomb to open so people can walk in and see that he's not there. He would have appeared to them anyway. So the whole idea is mythical. It's mythological. It has nothing to do with fact. It has to do with stories that were created much later. It's a human story for human people. 
written by human authors, uninspired by the divine. And this is why we see that it has human qualities all the way through it. Human thinking, human logic. The description of this truth must have been huge because it was big enough for, if we read the text that is found in John chapter 20, it was big enough for Peter and John and some of the other disciples to go inside to see, as well as Mary of Magdalene. And then if we read what John chapter 20 verse 12 says, just a few verses back, it says Mary of Magdalene and two angels were sitting inside the tomb, plus where the body was laid. So this was no small tomb. The idea that we have been given in forms that it was a small little dugout tomb is not the case. So why create such a large tomb for one single person? Remember this, and the argument people might say, well, it was a family tomb that dug out. No, it was dug out newly. It was prepared only for this body. No one had ever laid there before. It was a brand new grave site that was dug out of the rock. So again, it gives the idea that this is something that has been prearranged. What's the purpose for having such a large tomb? Unless you have, like we have looked at, from the bad text, the way it's been written, how badly it's been put together, a conspiracy is involved. In fact, when we read Mark, Mark tells us that in Mark chapter 40, verse 15, that Mary of Magdala and the other Mary, Mary the mother of James, and another woman went into the tomb and saw a youth sitting there. In John's account, it is two angels that were sitting there. In Mark's account, there's no angels, but there is a youth, a young man sitting there. Perhaps this young man or this youth, the reason he's not called an angel, or the reason he's not called a man with bright, shining, dazzling garments, as we will see Luke giving his different version again from all. So John, you have two angels. Luke, you have men dazzling with garments on. And in Mark, you have a young man sitting there. Perhaps the young man was caught in the process of moving or doing something, and so he quickly sits down. We don't know. We are just surmising and guessing. Anybody's theory is as good as anybody else's. The fact that Matthew, the fact that Luke, the fact that Mark, and the fact that John don't even agree who was in the tomb means that my theory is just as acceptable as theirs because all four of them couldn't agree on what they saw when they came into the tomb. So Luke tells us that there were these women and there were two men in dazzling garments inside the Luke story. So all of them have seen different things. And all of these people, at least five people could fit in the tomb at one time. Not necessary for just the burial of one body. And that the burial linen was lying there. So this again gives us the idea of the tomb being specially prepared for the safekeeping of something or somebody. Well, this is where the text has left us. And so next time, we'll continue from where we have left off today. So from me, Arib Islam, until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.